Hello, everyone, and welcome to the continuation of the Dharma and Justice Dialogue series from the Thich Nhat Hanh Program for Engaged Buddhism. My name is Peace Twesiji, and I'm the program manager of this program, as well as uh, Buddhism and Interreligious Engagement, where students are pursuing master's degrees here all within Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Uh, so this evening, the director of the Buddhist program, Kosin Gregory Snyder, uh, will be in conversation with Vimala Sara. Vimala Sara, also known as Valerie Mason John, is the award-winning author of nine books, including I Am Still Your Negro, an homage to James Baldwin. This summer, 2021, her new edited anthology, African Wisdom, New Voices, Talk to Black, or Talk Black Liberation, Buddhism and Beyond, will be published by North, North Atlantic Books. She is a senior Dharma teacher in the Tri Ratna Buddhist community and um, is a public speaker on mindfulness approaches for addiction and trauma. I'll put her um, website in the chat in just a few moments. Uh, Kosin Gregory Snyder is the senior director and assistant professor of Buddhist studies at Union Theological Seminary where he oversees the Master of Divinity program, a degree program in Buddhism and interreligious engagement, as well as the Thich Nhat Hanh program for engaged Buddhism. Professor Snyder is an ordained Zen Buddhist priest um, and Dharma transmitted teacher in the lineage of Shinryu Suzuki. He co-founded and is currently the senior resident priest at the Brooklyn Zen Center and Ancestral Heart Zen Monastery in Millerton, New York. Professor Snyder is currently working on a book exploring expressions of social justice rooted in Buddha Dharma, moral epistemology and praxis. I'm happy to definitely have you both here and um, of course, because I'm facilitating this conversation. I would also like to say a quick thank you to Ian Reese, who is working very hard behind the scenes to help this event run smoothly. And also to Cheryl and Pam, uh, the ASL interpreters here tonight, allowing for um, more accessibility for this event. So now what you've been waiting for. This evening's conversation will explore this. Uh, Rennie Ido Lodge wrote a best-selling book why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. And while this book continues to be critical in the conversation of race, uh, systemic and institutional racism, there is the black voice that is still open to talking to white people. Some of us have white parents, white siblings, white lovers. And so while these relationships may be fraught with tension, perhaps this is the place where we can make change happen. Bimala Sara says, I was told never to moan. Now I reclaim my voice and say, hey, white people, let's have a conversation. So I am looking forward to this conversation um, and hope that you are, are too. So just for those of you in the webinar, the Q&A box is open. So feel free to drop questions um, as they come up um, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen while the conversation's happening. Questions easily get lost in the chat. So be sure to put the questions that you would like the panelists to see in the Q&A box. Um, Ian will also do his best to bring in questions from Facebook and YouTube as well. So you can um, ask questions if you're streaming on one of those platforms. Um, and there will be time at the end uh, that's reserved for um, responding to questions that come in. So now I will hand it over to Kosin and Vimala Sara. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Peace. And um, I just want to say to everyone that Peace is the organizer and backbone of this entire series, very much the visionary of it, and has done a tremendous amount of work putting all of this together. So great deal of gratitude for all of that. Thank you very much. And welcome to all of you. And uh, welcome to Vimala Sara. I'm thrilled to have you here. This is uh, ever since this topic was written down, and I knew what we were talking about, I was looking forward to um, having this conversation and 
and, and see where we go with it. So we'll just jump into it. What were you, th what, when you brought that, when you brought this topic forward as a way to, um, as the focus for tonight, what did you have in mind? Thank you for, for asking that. And I think as two Dharma practitioners, I want to start with the body and um, how is your body right now, Kosan, as we enter into this conversation? Thank you for asking. Right now, alert. I have a feeling of being alert in my, um, in my belly, in my heart. So a feeling of awakeness, um, ease, uh, enthusiasm, and uh, a feeling of enthusiasm in my body, and a little bit of um, vibration throughout. Mm. Yeah. Thank but you. Feels good. How about yours? Well, my body um, feels quite opposite. There's nerves. Mm. There's tension. I'm just aware of the the bowel area, and just just aware that there's tension and nervousness that's how my body is right now which i think is really interesting isn't it having this conversation you as the white male and me as the um, black gender fluid female presenting person yeah 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 but it's good for all of us who are listening to pay attention to the body because this conversation will be an uncomfortable conversation if neither Kosen and I don't feel uncomfortable in this conversation and we most probably haven't had the conversation on why I'm still talking to white people yeah and as I look it's it's quite controversial because when I think of uh, the polarization one of the biggest polarizations is around white men black women you know that real polarization and I wanted to start with the body because we are interconnected so why am I having this conversation the elevator pitch answer to this is is that your liberation is bound up in my liberation period yeah in fact I see it that as black people we are the fingers pointing to the moon so that you as white people can really have your liberation, seriously. I was thinking about this the other day and I was thinking this, the whole topic of karma and people seem to see karma as really linear. And this is a real great example of actually showing how karma isn't necessarily, it isn't linear, not even necessarily, because in a way, the karma of the parka, the fruits of the actions of your white ancestors of hundreds of years ago are being played out right now. It's almost as if the God realm, if we think of the wheel of life, white people are falling out of the God realm, yeah, and moving into the hell realms, the hungry ghost realm. We know in that God realm, it doesn't last forever. That that isn't the place of liberation. And that one falls out and has to start all over again. So I'm having this conversation because it's really important that we, we have an understanding. And we remember that we are interconnected. And also, I have to also put into the field, it's not comfortable but I have to put into the field that I know in fact my first novel even spoke about it that actually some of my ancestors sold some of my people into slavery and why because this can be used against us and why why yeah it wasn't because they thought that was a good idea you know when you have people coming into your territory rounding up people, shackling them. Who's gonna go? Yeah, who's gonna go and who's gonna stay? So it was, it was an adaptation to trauma, this survival, this adaptation to trauma, yeah, to protect themselves, yeah. People wanted to protect themselves and so they sold. They decided who they were going to sell. 
And the other thing I want to make really clear is, is that slaves weren't brought to what we call the new world. No, slaves weren't brought to the new world. Africans were brought to the new world and enslaved. Very, very different. This is why I'm having this conversation because I want to get some facts right here. Slaves were not brought to the new world. Africans were brought to the new world in inverted commas and we were enslaved. So that's a bit longer than the elevator pitch conversation. So the, um, one of the things I know from our conversation, thank you, and one of the things that I know is important to you in this conversation um, that you said a few times is how this meets with the Dharma. We started with the body, and, um, and this is important for the Dharma practitioners to be in the body and fear. But what is, when you're talking about keeping this conversation going, what is the, what is the, the importance of the Dharma in this conversation for you? The importance of the Dharma in this conversation is freedom, freedom from the prison of the mind. Yeah, that's the importance, liberation from this, this body. You know, I've, I've been around white people and I say to them, what does it mean to let go of white self? And sometimes you're stonewalled. Sometimes you're told you're being provocative. Sometimes you're being told you're guilt tripping. And I'm like, really? Isn't this, isn't, isn't the whole practice, the whole, the whole practice of the Dharma? I, I love quoting one of these. If you hear me talk I often, do I find a way of, of, quoting what the prince said when he became woke. And he said something like, these labels that identify me as a man, a God, a human, a deva, have been destroyed by me. Yeah. So how are you as white people going to destroy that label of the white self? And it has to begin with the institutions because as we know, who benefits from the institutions out there in the world? I don't benefit from them. Yeah. So how, how are you going to destroy those labels? And we know, I mean, if we begin to think about allyship, we know that if a white person begins to align themselves with the black indigenous people of color, of course, they're gonna lose friends, you know? It's like when you begin to let go of your white self, you will become the true individual. And as my teacher, the late Sangharachita says that um, the true individual isn't necessarily the most popular person and I get it yeah so there's so much in this conversation that has to do with the Dharma let's let's begin with what brings people to our temples to our Buddhist centers and I'm talking about the the westernized temples and centers here what 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 brings people to our temples? It's a question, Kosan. What brings people? I think there are, there's a range of things. I mean, one are people who are really conscious of their suffering and are coming for that. They're clear that there's suffering in their life and that they're coming. For some people, it's a vague interest in meditation and what that means. For some people, it's, um, they feel they need spirituality in their life, but it's not particularly defined. You know, there, there's, a, there's a range, but I think at a certain point, for the ones who stick, it comes down to um, really facing one's own karma and the pain of one's, one's history. 
and um, and so that's what comes to mind. It's interesting, as you say, the ones who who stick. Yeah, who does stick? But let's come back to this question: What brings people to our temples, to our to our Buddhist centers? And I and I still say, even if we're we're coming for meditation or we're looking for spirituality, then there's some dukkha, there's some unsatisfactoriness in people's lives which bring them to our centers. Yeah. And I would say that people of color who come to our centers, which, and I say our because my, I, I'm aware that my earrings are banging on the uh, mic, so that might be, yeah, let's do that. So um, I would say that, um, that black, indigenous, multiracial people of color, bing pop people come to our centers because of racial trauma. Yeah, that's why they're coming. They might not even know they're coming because of racial trauma, because racial trauma has only recently come onto the map of trauma. OK, you know, when did we start speaking about racial trauma? Yeah. And so we have people coming into our spaces with racial trauma. And guess what? We can't speak about it because it's not the Dharma. And, and I, I want to open up the aperture a bit and say it's the same if people, what brings people to the rooms of 12 steps, you know, why do Bimpop people have these addictive compulsive behaviours? And often it's racial trauma blended with perhaps sexual trauma, blended with another trauma, but racial trauma is definitely at the court. At, at the core of this. And again, they're told, outside issue, no room for it here. Yeah. And this is why I'm having a conversation with white people to know that when Bimpok people are walking into your space, part of what is bringing them is racial trauma. And it's got everything to do with the Dharma, everything. What always strikes me, what you're um, bringing up, which I, we talked a little bit about this in an earlier conversation, is this line that happens um, where we understand the Dharma has to do with, with our karma, we understand it has to do with the self, but we, the, as soon as our, oftentimes our centers, and, and hopefully this is changing, but historically has gotten to the karma that has to do with racial violence, that somehow is not the karma we're dealing with. And, um, and it's, it, it feels like it stops there. And this always is puzzling because there's all of these um, methods within Buddhism that are responding to this history. Not to, you know, it's not explicit necessarily within the tradition, but it's responding to this history of pain and suffering. And yet, it is put outside that in the way that you're talking about. And um, it's just always seemed um, very uh, tragic that we, that, that, that we have not figured out. Because one of the things that I think to an earlier point you're talking about is for white folks to use these, this to look at their own grasping of whiteness, their own, our own traumas, our own um, history of violence in our own communities, our own history of, of turning that violence outward to other people using exile and domination as ways to organize societies. And seeing the way that that is being used, that we're using that on ourselves. And that it's that, 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 that kind of living through domination, living through stratification, living through exile, living through these ways of being with other people killing us all. I mean, we're talking about spiritual bypassing, aren't we? Yes. Really? <laughs> That's what we're talking about. And, and sometimes I just get uh, not 
irritated, but so often I hear it within my own community, white people saying the Dharma isn't therapy. And I think, well, if it wasn't therapy for you, you're lucky. But for many of us, it began as therapy. I mean, if we think, if we think of the oldest recovery program, if we think of the oldest therapeutic program, it's the Abhidharma, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> let's, let's get real about this, you know, all this mindfulness, this CBT, this DBT, the roots of it the Abhidharma, which understood the mind, but I want to come back to this. What's wrong with the Dharma being therapy? If that's, if, if that's going to bring some people some, some freedom. And I know for myself, the Dharma was therapy to begin with. It became more than that. It's, it's therapeutic, but it, 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 be, it became more than that. But what's wrong with the Dharma being therapy? And for many of us who come into the centers completely dysregulated, that's what meditation does. It regulates the central nervous system. And, and I, I, I want to talk about something else here, coming back to why I'm talking to, to white people. And people might still think, well, you know, why, why, you know, what does this have to do with me. I, I want to talk about white hatred. Yeah. I want to talk about white hatred and I want to talk about black rage. Okay. Yeah. That's the polarization. White hatred and, and black rage. And yeah, you know, there may be people listening now and this is this is really, really un uncomfortable. But let's let, let, let's go back, let, let's go back to, to ignorance, to slavery, how, you know, if, if, we, if we look at the colonization of the Aboriginal people in Australia, the colonization of the indigenous people in the Americas, and we look at the slavery, those of us who were taken from Africa and taken elsewhere. How, how could people do this? How could, how could this, there, this is a, a men, this is why I say what, 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 what does this have to do with Dharma? If we look at, if we look at the 10 precepts, one of them is undertaken to abstain from animosity. Mm. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Abstaining from animosity. And, and the point that I'm making is, is, is how that hatred has been passed down from generation to generation. When I think of how white women would have hated black women during slavery because their men were sexually assaulting black women, black women were giving birth to their white husband's children. How does one deal with that? Yeah as a, you know, as that white woman, that adaptation, that trauma of that, how does one deal with that? And how does the, the black woman deal with that? The rage, hatred, this polarization of rage, hatred. And, and I wanna speak even more about this, this, this white hatred. Are you, are you aware that there was a, a name, it was the, Slaves fleeing from their slave masters were told they had a mental illness. It was called drape to mania. Drape to mania. Yeah. Like, we were mentally ill, mentally sick. Let's talk more about this white hatred and this, this black rage. We weren't, we weren't allowed to read. We wasn't, we had to, we, we weren't allowed to read, not allowed to write. If, if, if we did, we would be beaten, whipped, weren't allowed to keep our names. Yeah, this, 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 this hatred, this, 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 this rage. And then it's like, if you think of the eugenics, the eugenics theory, this eugenics who tried to prove that 
we were animals that the, I always say the difference between the indigenous people and and black people is is that with the indigenous people I know in Canada it was like let's take the Indian out of the indigenous people and then we might be able to civilize them they didn't think they didn't even think they could take the African out of us because we weren't even human we were we were savages and to prove we were savages yeah we had the smaller skulls the smaller skull just just to prove yeah I went for a whole education system based on the fact that we were inferior in England yeah let's look at this this black rage white hatred yeah and and then you know if we if we look at today if we if we if we if we look at the killing of George Floyd, the hatred, this, this, this person was being filmed. He was being filmed. He was, he, was, he was being filmed. And yet he still kept his knee on Floyd's neck. Yeah. And, and I can quote 1999, his name, uh, Amadou Dalio, an unarmed black man shot 41 times, that is hatred, shot 41 times, dead with 19 bullets inside him, yeah, he was just minding his own business, oh, and the police say they thought he was a serial rapist, well, guess what, last week, a black man in Montreal, was arrested because they thought they thought he was the black man who was trying to kill the police and he was thrown in jail for six nights yeah this is yeah this 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 hatred this this hatred and this black rage and of course intergenerational trauma. I mean, Resma Menekam uses the acronym HIP, historical trauma, yeah. And in the black line, the rage is passed, passed down to us. And in that white line, you know, the hatred is passed down. It might not be so overt, it might not be so explicit, yeah. And, but I know I face it. I face it most days when I walk on the streets. Yeah. Who do you, who, if I'm with a white and a black person, who, and I ask the question, who does a white person direct the question to? Yeah. I used to, when I first started going to my Buddhist center, I would be in a space with other white people and when I walked out on the streets and I would say hello to a white person I'd been in that room with, they would turn their head as if they didn't know me. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is what we have to talk about. This, this hatred that has been passed on. And the hatred is, it's, it's subtle. It's subtle now. It's not explicit. So white people think, well, I don't have hatred. Yeah, it's subtle. Yeah, it's subtle just as our rage is subtle and it's killing us both. It's killing us both. Yeah, it's killing us both. And I know I'm having this conversation because our liberation is bound up in each other. If I think of Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, which came into Canada, she couldn't have done it with just black people. There were white allies to help, white allies to help, yeah, to help so that we could have our liberation and freedom. That's why I'm talking to white people because before, before you can even be an ally, I wanna talk about this, people, white people call themselves ally. Who says that you're aligned with me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a white ally. Really? 
<laughs> you aligned with me, really? Before you can even do, do that work of a white ally, one has to come into relationship with the trauma that's been passed down to you. Yeah, with that trauma, the, the legacy burdens, the burdens that have been passed down to you. And not just by your parents, but by society, by, by society, by institutions, the, the messages that they give about black people, people of color. We know, we know that the insurrection, the insurrection on January the 6th, we know that many Trump supporters, the hatred, because they want to keep black people down. We knew when Obama became president, that white men were beginning to get a bit digi, as we say in black, black speak, a bit digi, yeah, digital, a bit digi, I like that word, a bit digi, yeah. Their power, beginning to lose their power. There are white men, people like Jordan Peterson, who are people like Trump, many people who are holding on, trying to keep this, 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 white power, this white domination. But as we know in the Dharma, praise the Lord, hallelujah, everything changes, okay? Everything changes, yeah. It might not change quick enough and everything changes. So on that, let's go with that. Everything changes. What's the... Um, we have to look at this internalized hatred. We have to go through this process of seeing that the way that we have been harmed by that hatred, this hatred is bigger and deeper and not, I appreciate your generosity saying it's subtle. Sometimes it's not so subtle. Sometimes it's, it's, it's quite loud. And, um, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's something that we have to reckon with in white culture that that um, that creates this kind of hierarchy of domination in most of our um, ways of organizing society. We can see it showing up in corporations all the way to the way we create racial caste. You know, it's it's being replicated everywhere, and we have to. Um, and part of that we can call patriarchal, part of that we can call racial, there's, but however we want to call it, there's domination going on. And there's a way of seeing, turning toward people, there are some people who have less rank and there are some people that have greater rank and they, in some ways, deserve a different kind of treatment depending on that rank. And that is something, um, that is a core festering issue in the way that, that um, white folks tend to organize society, it tends to have a supremacist element to it. And um, looking into that in ourselves and looking into this body-to-body -body experience with each other and when am I doing that? When am I putting myself above? When am I putting myself? Buddhism talks very explicitly about not putting oneself above others. And yet there is this almost inscribed into the DNA that's been passed down to do that. Epigenetic. Yeah. Mm. So what is going, you know, to start asking, what did we do to ourselves, you know, to view the world that way? When did empire get encoded into, the, into our feet and hands and gut, you know? And how do we... Um, we start to take real responsibility for that and find another way that is not this, but is this. And that can come with, it can come with a sense of appreciation of one's own ancestry and ethnicity, but not in a way that puts it above another ethnicity and ancestry. And, and so I'll just, I'll just leave that open. I'm curious your thoughts in that whole arena. Well, as you, land on ethnicity 
and ancestry. I have to remind all of us that once upon a time we were all indigenous. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's the, the place to begin. Yeah, looking at our indigeneity rather than trying to appropriate somebody else's culture. And I can see that it's like, because all of us in our DNA, there is this indigeneity. And um, something else, this, this, this domination, um, the, way, the, the way systems have been set up. It's, I think uh, what we have to do is to, and another one is one of the 10 precepts that we know, I mean, unless you're part of the Vinaya, but in, if you're not, there are those four speech, four speech precepts. And one of them is undertaking to abstain from false speech. Mm -hmm. And many of these institutions have been founded on false speech. Take Australia, for example. It was said that Australia was tyrannous, unoccupied territory. <laughs> That's what was that till recently, that was what was taught. Unoccupied territory, completely denying the experience of the Aboriginal people in Australia. Yeah. If you think of the continent of Africa, the lies that have been told about Egypt, that that Egypt isn't part of Africa. And, and if it is considered part of Africa, well, it's, it's not the Nubians and it's not the, the, the Negroid race who were the indigenous people there. How could it possibly be? Because they were not capable of producing what the Egyptians have produced. Do you know, I think it's about three years ago that the British Museum had uh, sculptures I think it was from Ghana. They had been in the vaults for years because experts could not believe that Africans were capable of sculpting these images. Okay. The the lies, the the lies that that we weren't capable of certain things. That the, this is this is it's 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 the lies and we Again, it's that freedom from the prison of the mind. What, you know, uh, Robert Berbier says, talks about the fabrication and the concoction of the mind. And that many, that's the world many white people live in. If they are holding on to being in a position of superiority, being in the position of being at the top, that they are living within the illusion and the delusion of the mind. And this is why it's important because the Dharma is about destroying the fabrication and the concoction of the mind, which is why I say there's all this spiritual bypassing going on. I have to remind myself, you know, as, as good old Adi Shanti says, once you think you've got it, you've lost it. You know, and there are many white people who think they've got it. And if you've got it, you've lost it. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's about destroying the lies that have been told about our people. The, and the lies in the police force. I, there's a series that has um, come out in England by uh, Steve McQueen, Small Axe. And... Uh, in, in, in one of the programs, you've got the, the police sitting there playing spin the bottle, but spin, spin the bottle and uh, encouraging somebody to go out and, and, and get the nigger and the lies and, and the lies and the fabrication. If we, if we look at the exonerated Central Park vibe, the lies that kept those five kids in prisons all those years. And if Trump had had his way, they would have had the death penalty. 
the lies. This is what we have to work with, cousin. Are oh, the the lies? That's where it begins. What what creates these institutions are the lies, and we need to wake up to the fact that many of these institutions have been built on lies. Yeah. So maybe. Let's bring it back. Let's going with that. Let's maybe talk about our own Dharma institution. Yeah. And um, what's our role in uh, engaging? I mean, I, I I have thoughts, but I'm more curious about yours. <laughs> what's our what's our um, what's our role in um, being places? of transformation, recognizing that even our own Dharma institutions can be influenced by these lies. Even our own Dharma institutions can be built on them. Yeah, of course. Part of our role is what comes to mind are the affinity, the affinity groups that actually Dharma organizations, Western Dharma organizations, and talking about the Western ones, which, Dharma organizations which have been founded by white people. Um, we know that IMS, uh, one of the biggest Dharma, Western Dharma organizations in North America was founded by white people, predominantly white Jewish people. We know in places like England and Europe, again, a lot of these Western uh, Dharma organizations have been founded by white people which is great. And we have to open up the aperture and think, how do we make the Dharma accessible to all people who identify as being Western, who have been brought up within the Western context, Western conditions. And part of that is to not be afraid of affinity groups you know, it's all of, oh my God, how can we have, how can we have a black only group? Well, you know what? You had a white only group for how many years and now you're crying because people want a black only group. You didn't have to ask for your white only group because it was all white anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we, how do we, how do we make it accessible? Yeah, and making it accessible is firstly looking at I know one of the things that we start one of the things is a uh, poetry you know often Dharma teachers want to use poetry but whose poetry are we using and did you know that actually there are people who have a fear of poetry there's an actual name for people who have a fear of poetry but in that white aesthetic there is certain poetry and certain music which creates the conditions, yeah, which we think creates the conditions for people to, to liberate. Like, what about the rupa, the rupa that you have in your room? Whose features are on the rupa, okay? Because often when I walk into uh, Western, Buddhist center, the Rupa has often white Caucasian features. Yeah. So even that, there are subtle things that you can do aesthetically so that when people walk in, yeah, they can see themselves reflected. And some people will say, well, you know, if they have more African or more Asian features, how are we going to be represented? I say, well, what's the big deal? Because, because the Buddha wasn't white anyway. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The Buddha would have had pretty dark skin because they were an ascetic. They wandered. So they, they would have been dark anywhere and then been weather beaten and really quite dark. Yeah. So what's the, the big deal? But what I would say is, is that we have to 
come into communication. We have to come into communication and begin to transform the fears and to name some of the fears, yeah, to name some of the fears that perhaps people have. And what I want to say is, Kosen, we know that if you have, and I think you, you, I think you said it, I think I'll let you say it. What happened when you started to have more people of colour and started talking about social justice in certain sanghas? What happened? Yeah, well, I can talk about our experience. Um, it, it got rough, it got tough. Uh, it got tough. So, so um, what happened was the first, a few things happened. One is we brought in, um, this is, I guess, about eight years back, we brought in um, People's Institute and started trainings. So we started looking at um, racism within institutions and things that were being missed and so on that ended up um, affinity groups started forming, um, groups of white folks looking at their own internalized racism and using the Dharma to do that started forming, conversations started, that kind of went for a while. And then I started talking more publicly and other teachers started talking more publicly. Um, students of color came to me and talked about harms in the Sangha. That was brought up in Dharma talks and, and, and in community. And there was one moment where I was speaking to the community and um, about harms that had happened to students of color. And people became very angry with me. Um, they became very angry with me that I wasn't, um, I didn't have the right tone. I was bringing these things up that was splitting the Sangha. And basically it became an issue that the whole thing of talking about race and racial violence was a kind of splitting. And, and of course, the split was there, right? There wasn't, the, the, the conversation about it wasn't the thing that created the violence. What ended up happening was an almost a kind of framing that bringing up the conversation and not doing it just perfectly, whatever that looks like, I don't even know what that looks like, was the thing causing the harm. And people left. Yeah. People left, and so and so that was, and 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 it was a really difficult um, eighteen months of people who were were were, were um, angry on all sides, and we're getting through that now, and and we're finding trust and we're finding ways of having conversations, but it it is not, it is not smooth. You know, when you really do this for real and you really have these conversations, what comes up is everything that you've been talking about, which is deep-seated fear and trauma and a lot of unrecognized pain. And, um, and, for, and, and I think with this, this kind of socialized trauma in this way, it's, at least for white folks, um, it's so existentially threatening in terms of no longer understanding what your place is, what our place is in society. That we just, sometimes we just won't look at it and we'll leave. Now the ones who have stuck around, they're working hard. But, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> it's not pretty. And, and just know that many black people have left up until this point. Exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and this is this is this is what what happens. It's like if we really begin to make our places more welcoming. I mean, forget about diversity, inclusive inclusivity, and equity. As a friend of mine says in in the First Nations culture, we're getting rid of that. It's welcoming and belonging. Mm -hmm. How can we all have a sense of belonging and welcoming? And it may mean that actually there will be white people who will leave. Yeah, yeah they will do. Yeah. Yeah, and this and this thing about you know, I often all of us have heard this. Like if you if you um, if you speak certain things, 
people will not feel included. And of course, if you don't speak certain things, people will not feel included, right? So there isn't this, uh, this your, your point about lies, to not speak to it is to engage in the lying and to not speak to it is to let all of those allow this kind of situation where folks of color show up and then leave because there's no discussion of the world of pain that is, that is there. And, and I think that's the thing that white folks need to really get in Dharma communities is when we don't say it, it's violent, not when we do. Yeah. And I think um, just on that note, is that actually some people really don't see it. Uh, there's a psychologist called Professor Kenneth Hardy who speaks about this racial trauma like gas. It's this, it's this gas that you can't see it, you, you can't touch it. And we as black people know it's there, yeah? Because I think sometimes people are so blinkered that they, that they don't see it, that they, they, they don't recognize it. Um, and one of the things that I really do want to say and to remind people that when we get back to the place where we can open up our zendos, we can open up our tempers, tem our temples and our dharma halls, that actually it's traumatic for black people to go because on the way of going to the Dharma Hall, we may get stopped by the police. And when we leave the Dharma Hall, we may get stopped by the police. And that isn't imagination. And we know that there's, we have a very complicated relationship with the police, okay? White people have a different relationship with the police. I think the the whole thing with I've just read Amy Coomer, Amy Amy Coomer's been exonerated. They're not going to charge her anymore. But the fact that this this white Canadian in the states, Amy Cooper, really thought that she could could ring the police and the police would believe her and the police would protect her and she could lie again, lie and say Christian Cooper was threatening her life. Yeah. And the consequences of that could have been a dead man because while the police are supposed to keep us safe, yeah, sometimes black people have called the police because they think it's gonna keep them safe. And what happens is a dead black person comes out of that situation when the police have been called. So it's, one has to think of the, the bigger picture that that's, that's our life. That is reality. It's not imagination. Yeah. Be simply stopped for walking along the streets. It doesn't matter if you're a professor, if you're a doctor, this, we can never take off this black skin yeah yeah it's going to be visible yeah and i there's a fantastic quote of a uh, susan sontag i'm pretty sure it comes with susan sontag and she it's to do with identity and, I, and i've got it here because i wanted to quote from it verbatim i need the identity as a weapon to match the weapon that society has against me so you know, those of you who think, well, black people, they've got a chip on their shoulder, they're angry, they're aggressive. We need this armor to match what society has against us. Yes, we have black rage, white people have white hatred, and we have to begin to diffuse this. We've got to begin to speak about this. And I want to I, I, I just want to say this, that I am married to a white person and I was so relieved that my partner was away at work when George Floyd had been murdered. And I told her that, yeah, she could, 
received that. I told her that, that I was so relieved because there's times when you witness something like that. This is, I think also what I wanna say is because sometimes white people are saying, well, it happened in America. Why are the black people in Canada concerned? And why are the black people in England concerned? And why are the black people in Germany concerned? And then why are indigenous people who are all around the world are concerned? Because why are we concerned? It, when something like that happens, it activates our DNA and we know it. Most black people will be able to tell you the story about the police. If you, if you had white people and black people together and you said, cross the line if you've been arrested or stopped by the police, more black people are gonna cross the line. Yeah, okay, we know that, we know. Myself, I have my I have my own story of of the police and how badly treated I was by the police for being black, for being the only black one of the few black people on an anti-Nazi lead demonstration. We know, we know these stories. We know. Whenever I would be coming back into Canada, I was stopped every single time, and when I went into the room to be checked. Six people of color and one white person with the guitar. Yeah, it's not random, it's racism. And we have to recognize this. We have to recognize our part in it, how we collude, how we, how we collude, how we keep the lie alive. Yeah, and we as black people have to stop being codependent because we have become codependent to make it easier for you white people and what's happening now is it's like no longer is this codependency going to happen yeah this this and an example of that was for years people have been in rooms discussing will you take this statue down Will you, will you take the Confederate flag down? When one of the statues were taken down in England, I was just like, yes, you, you couldn't imagine the joy. I, I wanted to be there. I played it over and over again and just thinking the joy of people just knocking down statues that represented the slave masters or glorified colonialism, glorified slavery. People have been in rooms discussing, take them down. <laughs> the destruction of the mythos, rage, the uprising. No more discussing. You haven't listened. We've made it easy for you. They're coming down. Yeah. You know, when I'm, thank you for these. Thank you for bringing the stories. And um, when I say that, because one thing that when white people resist hearing, right, when they resist listening and hearing the truth of this, there's often this defensive energy that has something to do with reason. And um, there's nothing reasonable about any of it. And so to even process it in that way is not the place. And, and, and I think what we have to learn to do is listen fully with our hearts, which means if we listen fully with our hearts, all the pain is going to be there. And, and you know, the Buddha said a mark of existence is dukkha. It's just mm. done. Mm. Mm. And so mm. to be to listen fully with our compassionate hearts, knowing that it's going to be searingly painful mm -hmm. is the way through. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we have to build that capacity. Mm -hmm. We just have to build that capacity. Mm -hmm. Back to that liberation, I'm just thinking of the the Bodhisattva vow and just to, you know, if, if there are white people thinking I'm out there to help those black people, well, it, it's, 
it's it's not dualistic. Who are you helping? Help yourself first. <laughs> it's it's like if you help yourself, you're going to help others. And again, I because I know that we're moving into question time. Is that I just want to remind us that our liberation is bound up in each other. It's we're interdependent. Yeah. This is why I'm having this conversation with white people. And I know Rene, uh, Rene Edo Lodge is still having conversations with white people, with certain conversations not wanting to have. Yeah. But these, it's, it's, it's so important. It's so important. I cannot see how white people can have, let, let's put it in the context of the Dharma Halls, how white people can have uh, their liberation when black people are still suffering because of the color of their skin. We are born into trauma, racialized trauma. And it's not enough to just have your one black friend. It's, it's, it's not enough. And you have to understand that there will be some black people who do not want anything to do with white people rage just as there's white people who don't want to have anything to do with black people but there are those of us as I say who who were raised by white people I was raised by white people so I have a job there are those of us who have a white parent yeah those of us who have white siblings white cousins yeah we have a job we can be that conductor you know, during um, Harriet Tubman, uh, it was the conductors that helped free the slaves and we can be the conductor. And sometimes, I just wanna say this, when I think of Harriet, wrathful energy, we have wrathful deities and there is a place for wrathful deities. It's said that Harriet Tubman, when she would go to, a plantation and would meet some of the, the black slaves and say, are you coming? And some of the black slaves were like, no, I'm staying. She'd point a gun at them and say, you're either coming or you're dead. Everybody came, wrathful energy. Yeah, sometimes we need wrathful energy and it takes wrathful energy for change. Just, just look what's happened in this past year. It took wrathful energy, it wasn't enough. George Floyd's death was a catalyst, it wasn't enough because there's a whole list of people we can name in England, we can name in Canada, we can name in America, we can name in Germany. There are a whole list of black people, of indigenous people, of people of color who've been killed by the police. Um, many who have said, I can't breathe, yeah. And what happened with George Floyd was is that people came out on the streets, all races coming together, uprising and using wrathful, skillful energy, demanding change and change has happened and it's not enough. There needs to be more change. It's very easy to think change has happened and to sit back on our laurels and do nothing. No. I, I will not be fortunate enough in my lifetime to see the change that I want to see for black people, people of color, indigenous people. All I can do is leave a legacy so that the next generation can stand on our shoulders and perhaps have a better life than the life that I have had being a racialized person in society. Yeah, it's painful. But I do the work because when I see white people begin to liberate, I see freedom and it warms my heart. Thank you so much, Yunusai. That feels like a strong place to, to pivot towards the community who's out there with questions. 
So maybe we can invite some of those questions now. Yes, thank you for this, yeah, really honest conversation. Um, I want to invite uh, those of you in the webinar to, to continue putting questions in the Q&A box and those of you on Facebook um, or YouTube, you can put in questions and Ian will send them our way. Um, there's a question, oh, and there's a possibility um, if you wish and you're in the webinar, you can uh, raise your hand and we can um, bring you on screen to ask your question directly. And as people may or may not be raising their hands, I will go ahead and ask this first question that was typed in. And it was an invitation for the two of you, just as you started um, to check in with your bodies. And if you wish to share how you're feeling now and possibly even during how you're feeling during the conversation at different points. Well, I can start. It's, it's very lovely to see Pam here. Pam's a, an old friend. Um, we used to spend summers together at um, a music festival, Michigan, Michigan Women's Music Festival. And uh, so it's just really lovely having Pam signing for me. Yeah. So um, how I'm feeling in the body right now. I noticed that I was holding on to something in my shoulder and my neck. So I'm just releasing that. Uh, definitely there is some spaciousness in the body and some lightness in the body. And wanting to stay in the body, it's very interesting, papancha, the whole papancha, it's like, oh, you know, and to, just for me to just be in the body and just stay in this moment. That's how I am in the body right now. And for me, um, I feel sh a kind of shivering in my throat and my voice, pain in my heart area. My belly is activated. Um, and there's almost, there's a feeling of sadness. It's kind of trickling down through all of that. And, um, and also spaciousness with all of that. And, um, yeah. For sharing that, um, and to, to ask a, a, another question that came in around this, um, this question is for Vimala Sara. I'll read, I'll read it. It says, I so appreciate you starting this conversation by checking in with the body. In my experience in Dharma communities, people, particularly white people, listen to, listen to and get familiar with these conversations with their minds and don't know how to listen to their bodies. Could you talk about the significance of listening with the body in meditation practice and in these conversations for white people and for BIMPOC um, and how that's connected and perhaps crucial for our liberation? Thank you for this question. It's a favorite topic of mine uh, coming home to the body and um, I often say that people have been so traumatized that they're not in the body, they've left the body. They've left the body. All feelings have been switched off. Nobody is home. And I can remember one day sitting, uh, doing the practice of the Anapanasati and bursting out laughing because I could see so clearly that what the Buddha was teaching us was to breathe through the experience of the body. Four tetrads, yeah, the body, feeling, thoughts, and dharmas. It's all about breathing through and becoming aware of the experience in the body. And the reason why it's so important to 
come home to the body. Because if we think of the Honeyball Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta states it really clearly, at, like we have six sense doors and an external stimulus or an internal stimulus has contact with one or more of the sense doors. And with contact, there's always going to be feeling. You cannot avoid feeling. And what happens so swiftly is contact, feeling, thought, emotion, thinking, action, you know? And, and, and it can happen in seconds. This is, this is one of the ways you can see that is in through unconscious bias. Yeah, people aren't, we're, we're in a group and who are we gonna to gravitate to? You know, you go to, you go to a conference and you're, you, you have to stay for three days, those days when you went to the conference and it was all in person. And that first day, and you're looking around, who are you gonna make a beeline for? Yeah, because somewhere one has been activated and we go to our default, okay? And that's in the, the subtle way of, of that protector way, but this, this, this can happen so easily where we, we go into defense, we, we, we close down and we want to push away what we're hearing. And so it's so important to know what's going on in the body because it will give you an early warning sign that, oh, there's vulnerability here right now. Oh, I'm experiencing tightness. Maybe this is a bit of defensiveness which is coming right now. Maybe I just need to take a pause right now. Yeah. So it all begins in the body. And what happens is, is that we get so activated, we get stuck in the head and we stop listening to the body and we listen to the papancha, to the proliferation that is going around and around in our head and we identify with it and we concretize with it and it becomes me, mine and I, which is why that simple teaching that the Buddha gave us that when we get caught in this, what I call this stinking thinking, when we get caught in the fabrication and the concoction of the mind, it's just, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not I. Because the only thing you are listening to right now is this, you might think you're listening to the person opposite you, but absolutely no way. You're just listening to this. So it's important, this teaching of coming into the body. So we, as people of color, have so much to teach about being in the body because we, we are, you know, especially Africans, we're in the body. That's it. It's that, that thing of the grounding. We're, we're in the body. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I would say. Yeah, the importance, it's, it's imperative. Coming back to the body can save your life, coming back to the body. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we're going to invite um, Shelly on screen to ask a question. So Shelly, you can turn on your camera if that's available to you. Maybe it was an accidental hand raise. Maybe we'll try this again. Um, so George, I will invite you on screen to ask your question. Um, just a moment.
So Georgie, you can turn on your camera and ask your question when you're ready. Hi, George. Hi. Thank you so much, Kosin and, and Peace, for, for doing this and, and how wonderful to hear you, Vimlasar. Um, uh, you know, I feel like I've been waiting 65 years for this moment to a certain degree, uh, simply because I, I um, am an aspirant to many things in my life. But uh, um, I, I wanted to get to a, the point uh, that you raised. I had written a question in the chat about, um, you know, what I sense when I engage with people about questions of Dharma and race and social justice is that there, there seems to be a climate of what I call anti-Dharma. And for me, the anti-Dharma is this, where there is, everything is based on two minutes of attention, two min five minutes of mindfulness, a few minutes of feeling good, and then the answers are all there for you to be, ha to be had. And, oh, of course you hear me just fine and you acknowledge my, my presence, and isn't that wonderful? And you're gone. And so these, these hard questions, they, they never really get debated. They, they may get debated. I'm, I'm in academia. And so we have committee, committees and these committees meet and we debate them for hours. Mm -hmm. And then they get to the faculty and then you get to the faculty meeting and they go, oh, isn't that nice? And, and then they go on about their business. I mean, it's talk about short attention span theater. And so what, what I'm really concerned with is a, a kind of exhaustion that I have with trying to keep people's attention focused in a way that says, this is not that important to me. This is important to you. This is for you. This is for you to, I mean, I love uh, the way you, you, you coach the, the, the uh, you know, white, rage, uh, white, black rage, white anger. And, and there, it seems that there's, there's this almost uh, willful uh, action to shut down on matters of race, as if everyone has sort of hit this overload Everyone wants to acknowledge that some good things have been, been gone, but getting them to acknowledge that they have these deep-seated hate and, and beliefs is really, really, really difficult. So um, um, I, I just, I guess what I'm looking for is inspiration. I found it already, but, but to continue the, the fight, to continue the, the dialogue, uh, I did do a mindfulness practice before I got here. And then as you were asking to check in, I was, I was realizing that I was actually excited and just so stimulated because as I said, um, I've been waiting 65 years to kind of have these conversations this way. Mm -hmm. And I think for some of us, we have spent so much time, I get so, I get so long to get along that that it's been all about us surviving rather than us making other people mm. face their own realities and then, then say, and do you see what this is doing to me? Mm. But at any rate, um, thank you again. And thank you, Kosen. And I'll, I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say off, offline. Thank you. That was um, beautifully put, George. Uh, just uh, thank you for offering that and um, you know, as you speak, there's there's a phrase going through my mind, and sometimes I say, "I'm just I'm just a simple Dharma person. I'm a simple Dharma person," and and I love to, for me, I love to go back to the the princes, the prince, um, during that time of the prince becoming woke, because for me often the bypassing begins with because people say that the prince vowed to find enlightenment. The prince didn't vow to find enlightenment and that's a spiritual bypassing. The prince was smart because if you're vowing to find enlightenment, you are gonna bypass because what you're wanting for 
and what you're hoping for is this this bliss state this 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 bliss and we know that many even myself I've been there this bliss bunny just having blissful states and beautiful meditative states the the prince vowed to find an end of suffering At, that is so different and in finding an end of suffering one has to face the suffering and why is it that that many white practitioners want to turn away from this discussion of race. Why are they different from the prince if they really believe and are inspired by, by the story of the prince and how the prince became a Buddha? Because we know that when the prince vowed to find an end of suffering, he turned towards the suffering and was assailed by every mental state that you could imagine. Yeah, and face those mental states on. And even, not just that, even went into past lives and saw the unskillfulness in past lives. But why is it that as soon as we want to talk about race, that the walls go up? There isn't a place for that. That's why I say, that's why I say, spiritual bypassing, there's no liberation in that absolutely no liberation in that yeah one has to turn towards these things just as we do we have to turn towards towards the suffering so that's what i want to say in in response to that and i, I think the final thing that i would say is how to have those conversations is is in a way sometimes it's 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 taking time out how can we skillfully begin that conversation take time out in the same conversation and then come back to the conversation and take time out and come back to the conversation because what's actually happening is is that white people are getting dysregulated and when they're getting dysregulated there's the withdrawal might happen it's like the withdrawal or there's a narrowing down and they just can't hear anything or what they're hearing is oh it's my fault it's my yeah and so again that practice of if we have this conversation how can we take time out just to come back to the body come back to a bit of self-compassion and use the practice to have the conversation so it's not just having the conversation and forgetting the body but at times coming back to the body and taking time out and coming back into the conversation. Over to you, Kosen. Thank you. Uh, George, it's good to see you. Um, the, uh, the thing that comes, I think comes up for me is this, um, you know, one thing that we have to, we have to recognize ourselves is that and I can't speak for obviously every white person, but I can speak for what I've seen. And we have a whole lot of humiliation going on. And we don't just humiliate, um, we don't just act through humiliation as a culture with folks of color, we act it out on our children, we act it out in our whole world. And so there's this, there's this way of, um, there's this split that happens where we have to float in this good, pure notion of ourselves where we fall deeply into a sense of humiliation. And there's no catch there. There's nothing that catches it. And, and that's what is often witnessed is this, the minute the idea that there's some pure notion of who I am gets challenged by the reality of the violence of the world that, that our whole culture is clearly involved in, that it just crashes and burns. And, um, and what has to happen is we have to crash and burn. We have to start building, we have to start building, and this is where I feel the Dharma is so critical. We have to be sitting and we have to be practicing and we have to be doing the things that build the capacity to release ourselves from this very fragile purity or goodness that we have to hold up for ourselves in order to survive. But the problem is, is holding up that purity and goodness, we lord it over the world. And, and, and everybody else has to reflect that narcissistic view back to us or the whole thing blows up, right? 
and I'm sure you've experienced this more than once, you know, so, so there's, you know, that, that is the task that people who see themselves as white, which let's face it, we're not really, but as long as we walk around thinking that that's what we are, <laughs> then, and we hold up some purity and goodness around that, we're not going to be able to hear anything. So, so it's, it, we have to fall into the scary, humbling, terrible world that we're living in when we, when, when we realize that we've been a part of, of racial violence. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I have only been able to see this work in communities where we're really devoted to each other, where there's real love. And where we're saying, look, I'm in this for you. You know, and I'm going to do what I need to do because I don't want you to, I don't want you to suffer in this world anymore. And most people, I don't want, <laughs> most people just yet are not there. And I'm really hoping that it's changing because I can say something. Here's a little bit of hope. Here's inspiration and hope. Around dinner tables in my family, bringing up race, shut the whole conversation down my whole life. But ever since George Floyd, I have family members who are reading, are in book groups, reading Angela Davis right now. You know, I have, you know, the conversation doesn't shut the whole experience down anymore. The conversation can happen. And if that's, that's happening in more than just my family. And so if that's beginning to really happen in a meaningful way, then I feel a little bit of yay. Let's hope that that keeps going. But, um, mm. but it's, it's hard. Mm. Yeah. There is hope because we are in the form of, of the human condition. And if we think of the wheel of life, we can be in that human realm, which is the realm of possibility. Yeah, there is definitely possibility. When I say possibility rather than hope, definitely possibility. Yeah. I think I think that we're at eight thirty, and that is the perfect note to end on. That we're in the human realm of possibility, and um, and again, thank you so much, Vimla Sar, for showing up and 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 um, creating the conditions for a very honest and direct conversation. This is what we're hoping for in this series that we yeah. can put this out. Thank you for having me. And, and just to say that we, we didn't get to your questions and they are questions for you to explore. So just because we didn't get to answer these questions that please take these questions and begin to explore them in your own communities. And thank you so much for all of you who have been here with us. Yeah, take care of the body. Thank you all for coming. And, um, and please join us, there, there, there will be a few more in this series. And so just keep an eye out on the mailing list and um, I look forward to seeing you all and thank you for being with us tonight. Please take good care of yourselves. Amen. And thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. And thank you, Pam. Yeah. And thank you, Peace. Yeah. And thank you, Ian. And thank you for the conversation. Person. Thank you, Jim. Take good care of you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.